singing well there, and I can hear the parts coming out, so let's uh, focus on those, those who can do so, sing those parts, and let's pull out all the stops in five and six. Ne'er had ye felt the guilt of sin, nor sweets of pardoning love, unless your worthless names had been enrolled to life above. Five and six, let's lift it up. bow in prayer, could I just ask you to do something with those sheets, put them inside the hymn book that you have there, and then they'll be there for each night, and don't fold them over, just put them in something like that, so everybody can see them when they come maybe to sit where you're sitting on, a, on tomorrow night or some other night, appreciate that very much. Let's all bow together please, and we'll unite our hearts before the Lord in prayer. And let's seek God's face. Every believer laying hold on the Lord. So I'll just still ourselves, settling our minds and our hearts before God. We're in His presence. We're here tonight to do business with Him. And we certainly need the Lord's help and grace as we come before Him tonight. Let's all unite our hearts and let us all pray. Our God and our blessed Heavenly Father, we thank Thee that we're privileged once more to draw near to Thee in prayer. O oh Lord, what a marvelous thing it is that sinners who deserve nothing else but the damnation that sin brings are privileged to approach a thrice holy God and come into His immediate presence, even in the attitude of prayer. We thank Thee that there's a way opened up for us, that there is a means of entrance that has been secured for those who rest in Christ, even by His uh, perfect obedience and by His atoning death. And Lord, truly Thy people are a people who are saved from the damning power of sin. We thank Thee, Lord, that what we have sung here this evening in this marvelous hymn is not some mere theory. We thank Thee, O God, it is revealed truth. We bless Thee that we sing of that which God has made to, known to us in the Scriptures by way of the salvation provided in Christ. We thank Thee, O God, also that it is that which every believer has experienced. We bless Thee, O God, that every man, woman, and child in this gathering who has been brought into union with Christ has indeed been delivered from sin, from its guilt and from its condemnation, from all its power and defilement. We thank Thee, O Lord, for the sovereign grace of our eternal God, who loved sinners with an everlasting love, and gave His Son for them, and has therefore secured their redemption, even by the shedding of the Saviour's blood. 
And Lord, we draw nigh to Thee, therefore, through the merits of our blessed Saviour. We bow before Thee and we worship Thee this evening. We give unto Thee the glory that is due to Thy name. For Thou art God, and beside Thee there is no other. We would worship Thee, Lord, for who Thou art. And we would bow before Thee in that consciousness of Thy greatness and Thy glory and Thy majesty and Thy power. Lord, we confess this evening that we should be cast away from Thee forever. We should be banished to the lowest hell. And yet, Lord, we thank Thee that Thou art the God of all grace, and the God who saves men from their sin, and who delivers them unto Himself through His own blessed Son. And therefore, Lord, tonight we thank Thee for the coming of Christ into this world. We thank Thee for the Redeemer. Lord, as we would come this evening to hear this message that thy servant will bring, based on this great text in Colossians 1, we pray that the Redeemer will be exalted. We pray, Lord, that as thy servant expounds the word, the blessed man of Calvary will be lifted up and will be seen clearly and plainly by the souls of men and women in this gathering. Yea, Lord, even for the very first time, we pray that those here this night who are yet in their sin would have the eyes of their understanding opened to behold the Lamb of God and to come and rest by faith alone in the work that he has wrought both in life and in death. Lord, anoint thy servant, therefore, with God the Holy Spirit. We pray that this meeting will be under the Spirit's control. Amen. We pray, Lord, that he will uh, govern our gathering in every part. We remember our young people as they sing again for thy name and for thy glory, that they will know that help that thou dost give. And Lord, that even this night they will be blessed in their own hearts as they sing thy praise, and as that praise goes forth, may it be to the glory of our Lord Jesus. The Lord especially help thy servant. O Lord, we know from thy word that the preaching of the word is the central act of worship. And we pray, Lord, that this very night our brother will know the power of God resting on him, and the grace of God given to him to expound the book, and to bring the message that the Lord has uh, given for this very time. Lord, may he know power and freedom. May he know that unusual liberty, that help that the Spirit gives. We thank thee for last night, and we thank thee for the morning meeting, and the ministry of Dr. Barrett. And yet, Lord, this is a new time. As we often pray, Lord, we have not come this way heretofore. And we need thee to come and visit us and bless us. We thank, Lord, of the word that you gave us even in our own prayer meeting last Monday night. We thank thee that God is the God who comes to meet with his people on the ground of the atonement, to speak to them and to sanctify them. And Lord, we pray that we'll know a meeting with God this night, a visitation from God. O oh Lord, may we know thy power and thy presence in a very real and definite manner. We pray that thou wilt bless this conference as it goes on in the nights ahead of us, and thy will. Lord, we pray that thou wilt come and do something that will cause the town and the area to take note that God is on the throne, that God is in the midst of his people, and God is again moving with power. We long for such times, Lord, and surely we need them. We thank, O oh God, of our province, and we think, O oh Lord, of this entire island and the mainland, and, O oh Lord, we think of the darkness and the wickedness of our day. And yet, Lord, we look away beyond these hills, and we turn our eyes toward the God of glory, who has promised that throughout the entire New Testament age, the Holy Spirit is given. And, Lord, we're glad tonight that we have the Spirit of God with us. And, Lord, we pray that we'll know the moving of the Spirit in these days, in seasons of blessing and refreshing, from the very hand of God himself. Abide with us now. Watch over as we pray. May thy name be glorified. May a work be done for God's eternal praise, even this night. For we ask all this for the Saviour's sake, and in the Saviour's blessed and precious name. Amen and amen. We'll turn together, please, to the hymn 100. We 
had this as our conference hymn a few years ago, so we're going to just remind you of it and sing together a few of these verses. Number 100, O Christ, what burdens bowed thy head or load was laid on me. Number 100, and we want to hear you sing now as we sing a number of these verses, 1 and 2 and 4 and 5. And let's sing on to the Lord as we stand again to sing his praise. 1 and 2, 4 and 5. Our young people are going to sing for us this evening again. Once more I want to thank them for their hard work in preparing for these conference meetings. And we trust the Lord will bless them richly tonight as they sing his praise. Now unfortunately my wife has taken one of her headaches and she can't be here to lead them. So our sister Rhonda is going to do that, stand in tonight to help out in that way. But young people, please come. <clears throat> Let's hear you really sing uh, for the Lord's glory and for the Lord's praise.
now we hand over to Dr. Kearns, and we trust the Lord will bless him as he brings the word from heaven and preaches what God has laid upon his own heart. Amen. It's nice to be back in Balamina. We trust the Lord will meet with us tonight as we turn again to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Now I should explain I am not attempting anything like a coherent exposition of Colossians 1. That would take a very long time, the way I go about things. Uh, what we're doing is what in olden times would have been called occasional studies in Colossians 1. So we're isolating some things uh, in the chapter, not trying to integrate them into an overall view of the book and all its parts, but we're looking at some of these great themes uh, that the Holy Spirit lays before us in this wonderful first chapter of Colossians. We're going to read tonight from verse 9 to the end of verse 14. Colossians 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Amen. The Lord will add his own blessing to the reading of his precious word for his name's sake. Now let's briefly bow together in prayer just before we turn to God's word. Our loving God and our Father in heaven, we thank thee for the word of the Lord which liveth and abideth forever. And this is that word that is spoken unto us by the gospel. Tonight, our Father, we would pray that this living word, this vibrant word, will come with saving, sanctifying, edifying power to all our hearts. There are souls here who need to be saved just one heartbeat away from a lost eternity. They desperately need God's salvation. And yet, Lord, there are many who don't even know, know that they need this grace of God. Those who do know so often are fighting against any conviction that the Word may bring to their heart. We ask thee that thou wilt do for every unconverted man and woman tonight what John Calvin was able to testify God did in his life. Lord, make their hearts teachable and bring them to the place of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. There are believers who need to know the riches of the grace that is theirs in Christ. And they need to be led to live in the riches of God's grace. We confess to thee that so often Christians are like millionaires who live as if they were paupers. Lord, we pray, let us live according to the riches of thy grace. So bless us tonight. 
Fill me with thy spirit, Lord. Grant the anointing that the Holy Ghost alone can give. Give words of grace and words of power, words that will be effective. But, O oh Lord, they will be effective only as the Holy Spirit takes them. So now, Lord, we spread the burden of this meeting before Thee. And again we cry as we cry every, for every service, Hallow Thy name. Through this message tonight, advance Thy kingdom and accomplish Thine own perfect will. We pray in Jesus' precious name and through the merits of His atoning blood. Amen. This evening I want to direct your attention to some of the most famous and some of the most glorious words in all the Scriptures. Colossians chapter 1 verse 14 says, In Him, that is, in God's dear Son. Or to translate the Greek text very literally, and to be quite honest, while God's dear Son is a good translation, I can't say that it improves on the very simple literal force of the original words. In the Son of His love, that's what Paul wrote here. In the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. In the Son of His love, we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. I have quoted the text twice, and if you have paid even a modicum of attention, I have little doubt that you could make a very good effort at repeating it entirely. It's a very brief text. On the surface, it's a very simple text. And yet, it's, a, its message is immense and so profound that neither you nor I, should we live to be the age of Methuselah, will ever be able to plumb its depths. What the Apostle Paul writes here goes to the very heart of the biblical revelation, for he speaks of redemption. It may interest you to know that scholars, theologians, these great learned exegetes have long debated as to whether there is any central message in the Bible. You see, the Bible is a library of books. There are 39 of them in the Old Testament and 27 of them in the New Testament. A library of books that, as far as their human authorship is concerned, spans about 1,500 years. The human writers were very diverse. Some were scholars and some were herdsmen. Some were poets, some were very far from being poets. They had many differences in culture, they had differences as to the time in which they lived and worked. They gave their message against a great variety of social, economic and religious backgrounds. And so the question is indeed a relevant question. With this great variety of books written over such a span of years by men of such diverse positions in life and such diverse gifts, is there anything that ties them all together? And it may surprise you to hear that many 
of the so-called scholars, and I say so-called not to doubt their ability in languages and literature and psychology and history, but to doubt their knowledge of grace, because many of them have come to the conclusion that there is no unifying theme in the Bible. Now, for anybody to read the Bible and come to that conclusion, I would say he has to be as blind as a bat. Because, very clearly, from Genesis to Malachi and Matthew to Revelation, there is a theme that runs through the Scripture. There is a crimson cord that binds it all together. And the unifying theme of the Bible is quite simply the theme of redemption by blood. The theology of Scripture is fundamentally a theology of redemption. And that's what makes our text this evening so vastly important. I want us tonight to spend a little time on this text and its message. And let me put its message in one succinct sentence so that you will get it all clearly within your heart and mind. What is the message of Colossians 1 verse 14? It is that God's people have redemption and remission of sins by the virtue of Christ's person and by the merits of Christ's blood. God's people have redemption. And they have in that redemption the remission of all their sins. And they have it by the virtue of Christ's person and by the merit of Christ's blood. That is the message of Colossians 1 verse 14. Now in looking into this, we are going to try, and they say try, because when I studied Colossians 1 in Greenville, it took me two Sundays, and I daren't tell you how long it took me each Sunday to get through what I've said I want to do tonight. Uh, I will be much briefer here in Balamina, for I know that uh, I've got to get you to come back tomorrow night, and I know you want to get breakfast, lunch, and supper in between. So I'm going to be much briefer. But as we look at this, we're going to try and cover four areas. And first we start at rock bottom. We're going to think of the essence of redemption. You see, when you're dealing with any of these great theological terms, it's always good to get a clear definition in your mind. The idea of redemption in the Bible comes from the Old Testament. What I'm saying is that it is what we learn in the Old Testament that informs and fills out the doctrine that is taught in the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament that we gain our first and fundamental lessons on what redemption is really all about. Now, turning to the Old Testament, we discover that redemption means quite simply a recovery of some sort. A recovery. It's a recovery obtained by someone putting forth sufficient effort. That's redemption by power. Or by someone paying a sufficient price. That's redemption by price. Or it may be that the word in places will combine both of those, redemption by power and by the payment of the price. When we turn to the Old Testament, we discover that redemption may apply to the recovery of people or of property. When it speaks of the recovery of people, the message is always a recovery 
and a release of people from slavery, from bondage. The picture is always of a people who have fallen into bondage. They have become slaves and someone enters in by power or by payment or by both and sets them free. So the redemption of people is the recovery of slaves. As regards property, in the Old Testament, redemption is usually the recovery of a lost or a forfeited inheritance. Now let's turn for a couple of examples. The classic Old Testament example of the redemption of people is, of course, in Exodus chapter 12. You remember the story. For generations, the children of Israel had been in the land of Egypt. The longer they were there, the more they became objects of suspicion and hatred, until finally there arose a pharaoh, a king over Egypt, who knew not Joseph, and who looked with such suspicion upon the Israelites, they had become, by the way, so numerous at this time, and though the scholars are a little bit uh, dubious as yet, or at least there's some conflict as to exactly which dynasty of pharaohs uh, was in charge at this time, I think there is evidence to say that the pharaoh uh, and his dynasty to which the Bible refers was one who felt the weakness of his position, and felt that it wouldn't take much to overthrow him, realized that the children of Israel were so numerous and so powerful that if they were left to keep on multiplying, all they had to do was join hands with any enemy, external or internal, and his throne would be overthrown. So he immediately set about reducing them to slavery. The book of Exodus tells us of the bitter bondage of the children of Israel. And it got deeper and deeper and worse and worse with every passing year. It got even worse once Moses arrived in the scene. But the Lord looked down and he said, I have seen the affliction of these people. I have heard their cry by reason of their bitter bondage, and I am come down to deliver them. That was it. You remember how at the end of the plagues, the last plague, he said, I'm going to pass through the land of Egypt. The death angel is going to come through. He's going to slay the firstborn of every family of man and beast. But he said, for the redemption of the children of Israel, you take a lamb, you shed its blood, you sprinkle its blood upon the doorpost and upon the lintel of the house, you shelter beneath the blood, you prepare to make your escape. When the death angel comes through, I, when I see the blood, will pass over you. I will pass over you. And that's what happened. And that night, God led the people out. They were recovered. They were redeemed. I know they were redeemed because summing it up, in Deuteronomy 7, verse 8, Moses said, Because the Lord loved you, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen, and from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So that's the classic example of the redemption of people. It is bringing slaves out of slavery and setting them free. We'll come back to that in due time. As to property, the example is given, and perhaps the easiest way is to look at Leviticus 25, verses 24 and following. In all the land of your possession, ye shall grant a redemption for the land, if thy brother be waxen poor, and hath sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. We'll finish there. The passage goes on to give more details. But I think we have read enough to get the picture. Here is a lost inheritance. An Israelite 
has lost his original inheritance. Now the Lord says there is provision made for its redemption, for its recovery. How is it recovered? There is one who is nearly related to him. He is too poor to do anything himself. He has lost everything. But here is one who is nearly related to him. The Hebrew term goel gives us the idea of a kinsman redeemer. A kinsman who comes to redeem the lost inheritance of this poor person. And the Lord says, the law of God is that there must be provision made. There must be the opportunity given for this lost inheritance to be regained, to be recovered by the intervention, by the work and by the payment of the kinsman redeemer. Now these are the ideas that form the cargo that the word redemption carries forth into the New Testament. I don't think you need a preacher to fill in the details, to cross the T's and dot the I's. We, guilty sons of Adam's race, we have become slaves of sin. We, guilty sons of Adam's race, have lost our original inheritance because in Adam all die. Because of Adam's sin, we are born sinners. We have lost the inheritance that was given to our first parents initially at their creation by the Lord. But, thank God, we have a kinsman redeemer. There is one who is near to us, bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. And herein lies the importance of having a true grasp of the biblical doctrine of the person of Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. He became man. But understand this. The heathens were used to ideas of gods who became men and of men who became gods. There was the debasing of gods to the level of humanity. There was in the heathen mind some strange notions uh, about the raising of men to godhood. In fact, every Roman Caesar decreed himself to be a god, to be worshipped by his people. But that's not what the Bible's talking about. The Bible is saying that the eternal Son of God took into a union, a real and personal union with Himself, a true humanity, that by an ineffable and indescribable miracle, God the eternal Son entered into union with that first embryonic fragment of a human nature from the, uh, in the womb of the Virgin Mary and of her substance. I cannot explain that. If I could, it would no longer be a miracle, would it? I cannot explain that. But here we have the miracle and the mystery of the eternal, absolute, infinite, immense God of glory in personal union at this stage with the tiniest embryonic fragment of humanity. And as that embryo grew and came to birth, it was a virgin birth. Here's the importance now of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. We're dealing with God manifested in the flesh, born without sin, and yet truly human. I don't want to digress too much tonight, because I have a long, long way to go. But it is important to get this. 
there is some very dangerous deviation from this historic biblical doctrine of the incarnation and virgin birth that has made its way into various parts of evangelical religion. I don't say that it started with Dr. Uh, M. R. Dehan, but certainly Dr. Dehan, who was a medical doctor, he gave it a lot of uh, publicity, and because of his medical qualifications, it gained a lot of acceptance. And he talked about what happens in the womb of a mother, and how the walls of the villi e uh, they um, separate the bloodstream of the infant from the bloodstream of the mother. And he then made a logical jump that was totally illogical, unmedical, and nonsensical. And he made the logical jump that the mother contributes nothing to the developing bloodstream of the infant. Every bio or biologist in the world now knows how false that is. But the concept was this. That Mary, and I don't want to be crude here, I want to be as as careful as I can be, and as respectful as I can be. But to get the picture clear, Mary contributed no more to the essential humanity of Christ than a bottle would contribute to the essence of the liquid that it carries. She was merely a bearer. That's not biblical. If that were so, the idea, and this used to be taught by the early Plymouth brethren, uh, that God created a heavenly humanity that He placed in the womb of the Virgin, and she simply carried it to delivery. There is no salvation for earthbound sinners by this figment, this creation of a heavenly humanity. There's no salvation that way. Listen. By man came death. By man comes the resurrection of the dead. Jesus Christ was not a look-alike of a man. He was a real man. He was made of the Virgin Mary, of her substance, by the miraculous operation of the Spirit of God. So he is bone of our bone. He is flesh of our flesh, yet without sin. But he stands related to us. He is our near kinsman. And if he isn't, we're lost. But thank God, this is the Gospel. The Son of God, can you imagine... Can you imagine what some preacher, call, one preacher called the extravagance of the love of God? The immense and glorious lengths to which God went in love to save us poor guilty sinners from our sin, that the Son of God assumed into a personal union with Him that will never, never, never be dissolved for all eternity, a true humanity, in order that being our nearest relative, our kinsman, He could become our Redeemer. By power and by payment, he could set us free from slavery and then recover our lost inheritance. If you're in this meeting tonight, a slave to sin, I have to tell you, Jesus Christ is able to save. He's able to save to the uttermost. He's able to place in your possession a real redemption. He's able to recover for you all that you lost in Adam. This is the essence of redemption. Now let me fill out one or two of those details as we think of the elements in redemption.
Because from what we have seen, the first element here is freedom. Freedom. This recovery from slavery means freedom. Verse 14 obviously follows immediately after verse 13. But what does it say there? It speaks of the, the Lord who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Now follow those words carefully, for here is the freedom. He hath delivered us. The word delivered simply means He hath rescued us. He hath rescued us. Now I want again, if you're unsaved, I want you to see where you stand before God. Because, you see, here's the trouble. So many people, and perhaps you're among them, they value the gospel very lightly. They value the cause of Christ very lightly. They value the call of God very lightly. Because they do not understand where they really are with God. The picture here is of you as a slave. But not only as a slave, a slave in deadly danger. You're a slave, but you're in danger. It's bad enough to be a slave in this world, a slave of sin, a slave of Satan. But oh, to be within a heartbeat of a lost eternity, to be one step away from outer darkness, to be one blink of your eye away from the eternal torments of the damned. Danger! This is real danger! Boast not yourself of tomorrow. You don't know what a day will bring forth. I have a scene in my mind as I say that. A scene that I think I'll never forget. I preach to a man every week. I can still see in my mind the seat in which he sat in my church. He wouldn't go to any other church. You wouldn't have found him listening to an unsaved minister for love nor money. He wanted to be there, and there he was every Sabbath morning listening to the preaching of the gospel. I remember one Sabbath morning shaking hands with him, and out he went. He went to work on Monday, and he worked all day, and everything was fine. And he came home, and he had a supper, and he went to bed, and everything was fine. He got up in the morning, and everything was fine. He had his breakfast, and everything was fine. He turned to his wife to say that he was on his way, and as the words were breaking out of his lips, just like that, he dropped at her feet, and he was in eternity before his body hit the ground. The thing I'll never forget is this. That no matter how I preach to him or how I talk to him, he never saw the need to come to Christ. Eternity. Eternity. Where is that soul in God's eternity? Ah, oh, there's danger. But here we read, He delivers us. He rescues the slave in danger. He rescues you from the power of darkness. That's satanic power. That's sinful power. He rescues you from the power of darkness. And He translates. The word translate simply means He transfers you into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Freedom. Oh, it's great to be free. Free from guilt. I have dealt with people who have gone almost, and some of them indeed have gone all the way to the madhouse, eaten up by guilt. Guilt. It's guilt that makes the world go round. Guilt is the great problem of the day in which we live. No matter how much men deny God, 
No matter how much men deny God's law, no matter how much men neglect the gospel, no matter how much they spurn and mock at the things that are spiritual in Christ, they can never get away from the guilt of their sin, the gnawing guilt of those who are living in breach of God's law. But there's freedom from guilt under the burden of guilt and care. Many a spirit is grieving who in the joy of the Lord may share life everlasting receiving. There's freedom from the curse. There's freedom from condemnation. Can you imagine what it is to be able to look God in the face and say, there is therefore now no condemnation to me because I'm in Christ Jesus can lay my head upon the pillow and I can know it is well, it is well with my soul. Freedom from the damning power of sin. Freedom even from the domination of sin. He delivers us from the power of darkness, transfers us into the kingdom. That is, He makes us subjects of the Son of His love. There's freedom. Tell me tonight, if you come to this meeting, bound up in sin, guilt, under the curse, stumbling in the broad road to a lost eternity, afraid to put your head in the pillow at night, knowing that if you die in the bed in which you go to sleep, you'll open your eyes in hell. Let me tell you, our kinsman redeemer can set you free. There's not only freedom, there's forgiveness. We have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. You know the word forgiveness is one of the most beautiful words in any language. In the Greek text, the word simply means, uh, I would have to say the simplest way of putting it is a release. It's something that's lifted away. That's a beautiful picture. It's lifted away. It's released. Forgiveness of sins. The remission of all your debt to God and His law. Gone forever. You remember the words of the Lord Jesus when He stood before the adulterous woman? You remember those Jewish hypocrites, the leaders of the Jews, dragged a, an adulteress before Christ? And said, uh, we found this woman taken in the very act of adultery. Now Moses in the law says that she should be put to death. But what do you say? And they were trying to ensnare him, get him into a row with the Roman authorities and all that sort of stuff. But like, always be careful when the devil quotes scripture. Always be careful when the devil quotes scripture. And that's what we have here, the devil quoting scripture. Moses in the law did say, you put her to death. Lie. Moses didn't say any such thing. Follow it carefully. They said, this is the woman that we took in the very act of adultery. Now the last time I considered it, it took two people to commit that sin. And Moses said, you put them to death. Not her. Them. The hypocrites had let their crony go in order to ensnare the Lord Jesus. But what a humiliation for that woman. She was indeed the dregs of society. She stood there publicly shamed. And one by one, under the conviction of Christ, her accusers went away. The Lord Jesus turned and looked her full in the face, and I have no doubt, I have no doubt that she trembled. She's looking into the eyes of God incarnate, the Holy One, the pure and sinless One. How he must hate my sin. And he said, Woman, where are your accusers? They weren't there. She said, there's no man here to condemn me. And then these words from the lips of the Savior. 
neither do I condemn you. Put yourself in that position. Indeed, you can be in that very position tonight. Where Jesus comes and says, I haven't come to condemn you. I have come to forgive you. Do you remember in Mark 2, how we read in the great crowd in a house, perhaps the house of Simon Peter, they broke down, opened the roof and they let down a man sick of the palsy. They wanted Jesus to say, I heal you. Well, he did heal him, but that's not what he said to him. He said, thy sins be forgiven thee. I think that at a vast congregation like this tonight, there must be many a man and many a woman, and you're haunted by the past. You know things about you that you hope nobody else ever gets to hear. You feel the shame and maybe rotten inside and you're afraid to look God in the face because you fear his condemnation. Let me tell you the glory of the story of redemption. It's a story of forgiveness. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. What a beautiful statement. How do you measure the distance from east to west? It's immeasurable. There is no such measurement known to man. What God is saying is, from eternity's length to eternity's length, I separate you from your sin, and I will remember it no more forever. For I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgression for mine own sake. I will not remember your sin. All this is in redemption. It's forgiveness. But there's not only freedom and forgiveness. There's more. There's fullness. Redemption, remember I said, always brings restoration. It brings a reinstatement into the full inheritance that God has for his people. What did Adam have when God created him? Adam had righteousness. Adam had holiness. Adam had knowledge. Adam had dominion over the creatures. Adam had full, unrestricted fellowship with God. And Adam had a place in the paradise of God. That's what God gave him. Now he lost it by sin. And we lost it in his sin. Christ comes. He doesn't only free us from guilt and curse and condemnation. He doesn't only forgive us the debt of our sin to God and His law, but He reinstates us and we gain in Christ all that we lost in Adam and a whole lot more with this added blessing that we can never lose it again. For Christ will never fail. There's fullness. Oh, I want you to understand tonight. The devil is the greatest old liar in the world. The devil blinds men and women and young people into thinking, look, look at the world's life. Look at the glitter of Hollywood. Listen to the, the, the beat of the rock musician, usually thumped out, uh, out of a drug-infested stupor. Listen to it. That's life. See the tripsing feet of those on the dance floor. That's life. Listen to the raucous crowd as they yell their support for their own particular idols. That's life. That's fullness. Now look at Christ. Look at the gospel. Look at being saved. And that's an empty, boring, dead, and awful existence. Don't you believe it? I'll put it to you very simply. Did you ever meet a drunkard that was sorry he took his first drink? Have you ever met an, uh, a drug addict that was sorry that they ever took their first fix? 
For if you haven't, I have, and I think you know that it's true. How many drunkards do you know on their deathbed are looking for the publican? There was a publican on the Raven Hill Road. And he cursed and hated the name of Ian Paisley when he went there. Because so many people were being saved that his, his uh, clients were falling away and he wasn't selling as much booze as he had sold here before. And he hated Paisley and he cursed Paisley. Paisley was the devil incarnate. But that man came to die. And as he was carted off to the hospital, after the hospitals usually closed up their doors after visiting ours, and after the doors were closed, he sent out for somebody. Who was he looking for? The distiller? The man who delivered the booze to his pub? Was he looking for a fellow publican? Was he looking for another alcoholic? No, sir. He said, send for Ian Paisley. That was the night when the doors shut. Dr. Paisley, young and skinny as he was in those days, found an open window in the hospital and climbed in and found the way to the man's bed to open the scriptures with him to tell him the message I'm telling you. There is redemption for the vilest of sinners. There is freedom. There is forgiveness. And there is a glorious fullness. No, when you come to die, you'll not be looking for the worldly crowd. That tells you something. Now let me ask the same question I asked a minute ago in slightly different terms. Yes, we have all heard and known of drunkards that are sorry they ever started to drink. Tell me, have you ever met a born-again, blood-washed, redeemed believer in Jesus Christ that's sorry he ever got saved? Have you ever met one? I've been saved for many years now. I've been preaching for 45 years. I've never once met a Christian that was sorry he ever got saved. It tells you something. There's a fullness in Christ. There's life in Christ. There's more abundant life in Christ. There's overflowing life in Christ. There is joy in Christ. There is peace in Christ. There is the knowledge of acceptance with God in Christ. You can face today with Christ. You can face tomorrow with Christ. You can live with Christ. You can die with Christ. A few years ago, in fact it was the year 1990, I'm one of those people that until now, and I realize I don't say this bombastically, it's the goodness and mercy of God. But I'm one of those people who went through life with a, a, a very minimum of any uh, medical difficulties. But I did need to have gallbladder surgery. I put it off for so long, it was getting worse and worse. And finally, uh, the attacks were becoming more prevalent, more uh, frequent. And the pain was becoming uh, so much that finally... My wife prevailed and I was packed off to the doctor. They sent me down to one of these tests where they'll lay you out on a slab like a corpse and they plaster stuff over you and run a little ball over you and this uh, ultrasound is finding out all that's inside. Well, I knew where my pain was. It was right there and right round to the back. And uh, I thought I knew what was wrong with me. I went at a time when I was the only person in the entire facility. There was nobody else lying like a corpse on a slab of marble. Nobody else but me. And she came and she did something here and then she got away from here and she was poking around up here and she couldn't get away from here. She was poking and poking and poking and poking. And I said to myself, what on earth are you doing, dear? The, 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 the pain's down here. Forget about up there and get to where the trouble is. But she kept on up here. And then I heard her talk to uh, another person I couldn't see. I have to say it was most unprofessional of whomsoever they were speaking. She didn't say who they were talking about. She just said that she saw something deep in the pancreas. And lying there in that slab, I realized if she's talking about you, you'll be dead in six months. I'd gone for what I thought was a very simple 
diagnostic procedure. If she's talking about you, you'll be dead in six months. She didn't say she was talking about me, but there was nobody else there to talk about. And she didn't mention any other appointment. I remember going home that day, then down to my study. It was a sobering moment. I remember getting on my knees before God. I said, Lord, I have got to know that the Christ I have lived by is good enough to die by. I was 40, what, 50 years old. I had my work, work yet to do. I want to tell you something. That was a great experience. That girl was most unprofessional. But that was a great experience because there, in that hour alone with God, I found perfect peace. The Christ I know is good enough to die by. He gives you fullness. Because he gives you a future. You see, in redemption there's always the pledge of something more. In Ephesians 1.14, you find that the Holy Ghost is the earnest of our inheritance. He is the pledge. This Holy Spirit that we receive when we are redeemed of the Lord. This is the pledge of our inheritance. And what's it saying? I haven't only dealt with your past. I'm not only helping you in the present, but I'm giving you a future for all eternity. These are the elements in our redemption. Now all that's very good. But it's no use to you unless you have the third great truth here, which is the experience of redemption. You see, you may agree doctrinally with everything I say, but unless you can say, I have redemption, this will not bring you to heaven. It is not that there is redemption that gets you to heaven. It is that there is a redemption that has come into your personal experience. We have redemption. This is a present possession. We have it and we know it. Assured by the Word of God, through the merits of Christ, by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, I am redeemed. Now let me ask you tonight, can you honestly say before God, as I sit here in Bellamina, I have redemption. I have forgiveness of sin. I have this glorious freedom. I have this wondrous fullness. I have the Holy Spirit indwelling me as the pledge of a glorious future. I am redeemed. Can you honestly bear that testimony before the Lord? This is a present possession. It's a privileged position, for this redemption is in the Son of His love. You see, redemption's not in the church. Redemption's not in the sacraments. Redemption's not in your decision. Redemption, listen to me carefully, is not even in your faith. It's received by faith, but redemption is in Christ. It's in union with Christ. Redemption can be enjoyed only as you're united to Him. What is union with Christ? Union with Christ is that oneness that exists between the believer and the Lord Jesus Christ, by virtue of which Christ is the Savior and He's the source and the sustenance of our spiritual life so that we receive from Him all his saving merit and power. Time forbids that I preach on what it is to be in union with Christ in a federal, personal, vital, spiritual, mystical, and total and eternal union with Christ. But I want to tell you, when you're put into Christ, it's like he's the head and we're the body. 
That's union. Or, Ephesians 5 says, He's the bridegroom. All believers are the bride. They're one in the covenant of God. And as Spurgeon was writing in that hymn tonight, nothing that all hell can do can break it. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is in Romans chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or peril or nakedness or sword? Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Listen, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you're in Christ, my friend, you're secure for all eternity. We have redemption in Him. This is a purchased possession for it's through His blood. I want you to understand this. Redemption comes to you tonight absolutely free of charge. You don't pay for it now or later. You don't do anything to make yourself worthy to obtain it. It comes to you absolutely free of charge. But listen, that doesn't mean to say it costs nothing. It cost God everything. And if I could say it very reverently, God paid so much for our redemption that even He could pay no more. He didn't send an angel. He could create angels with a word. He sent His Son, the Son of His love, who poured out His soul unto death, who shed His precious blood, Peter says, you were redeemed not with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was in these last days manifested for you who do by him believe in God. Let me tell you tonight, redemption comes having taken everything that God could pay to purchase it. It's a purchased possession through the blood of Christ. Let me finish with a word about the expectation of redemption. I said that the Holy Spirit is the pledge of our future. And this word redemption carries in it implications for the immediate future and for the remote future. We have an immediate expectation. When you're saved, you're called unto liberty, to use Paul's words in Galatians 5, 13. You're called unto liberty. And the expectation, therefore, is Galatians 5, verse 1, that you stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free. When you're saved, the immediate expectation is that you'll be holy. You say, I couldn't be holy. I can't overcome this, I can't overcome that. Some people say I'm not saved because I couldn't give up this or I couldn't give up that. We're not talking about your power to give up anything. We're not talking about your willpower to overcome anything. We're talking about the liberating power of the redeeming grace of God in Jesus Christ. And when the Lord saves you and redeems you, He sets you free unto holiness to live a life of loving fidelity to the Lord Jesus Christ. Once you're saved, remember your redemption and live as those who are redeemed. You're not to live as if you're still in bondage. We reject every token of that bondage and every thought of returning to it.
That's the immediate expectation. In other words, God can change lives. God can change lives. I uh, was uh, at a church just last week, a free church, and I saw two very old friends of mine. And as soon as we met, we hadn't talked for a number of years. As soon as we met, clasped hands, just like that, we all went back many, many years to 38 years ago. When I erected, or <laughs> let me rephrase that, I stood by while others erected. I got in the way for my knowledge of it, even though I'd been a Boy Scout, was not particularly profound. We erected an old ex-army tent in a farmer's field in a place called Largue, outside Limavade. We didn't know the farmer, but he was kind enough to let us put up the tent and he even give us a long wire that we strung about four or five lights so that what would have looked like the black hole of Calcutta looked like the black hole of Calcutta with four or five lights in it. And there night by night I preached the gospel. One night a man and his wife came forward. I talked to them and we knelt together in the grass and I, they came to Christ. I knew the lady a little because I knew her mom very well. I didn't know the story. I didn't know as I knelt with them that night that drink had taken over his life. His wife told me, she said, when he would, I would open the door at night, he would just fall in and I would kick him aside with my feet. Our lives were over. I felt I could take no more. That night, I met with Jesus. And everything was totally changed. 38 years later, a little older now, obviously, but 38 years later, he's never been back in the booze. Lives changed, home changed, marriage changed. They're not yet in heaven, but they have learned to live in heaven because Jesus says to them, I have made all things new. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The Lord can change you, make you a new creature in Christ. This is the immediate expectation. There's liberty. But then there's the ultimate expectation. Listen to me. Redemption is for eternity. We're going to enjoy it forever. It's good to be saved now. But what must it be to be there? We're going home to glory soon. To see the city bright. To walk the golden street of heaven, to bask in God's own light. But some of you are out of Christ and held by many a snare. We cannot leave you lost and lone. We want you over there. There you will enjoy forever redemption as purchased by Christ. In the day of redemption, your very body will be glorified and made as sinless as the creation of an angel. So that body and soul, you will be united forever in the praise and worship and service and enjoyment of Christ and all the pleasures of heaven. Redemption has an ultimate expectation. Jeremiah puts it very well in the 29th chapter. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. The Hebrew text, to give you an expected end, means literally and simply, 
to give you a future and a reward. That's it. Redemption is forever. But so is retribution. If heaven is forever, so is hell. When I talk about redemption, I'm talking about the recovery and the rescue of poor perishing sinners out of the jaws and teeth of hell into the loving embrace of the Son of God's love by His power and through the merit of His blood. In Christ we have redemption. Is that your testimony? If it is, rejoice. If it is not, the question may be in your mind, how do I enter into this redemption? Listen, all the benefits of the covenant of grace are received by faith alone. You don't pay for this. You don't work for this. You don't get yourself ready for it. You don't get yourself part way there and say, Now, Lord, I've done my best. Take over. You come as you are, a poor, vile, guilty, wretched sinner. You hear the call of the gospel. Go back to the children of Israel in Egypt. Take the blood. Apply the blood. Get under the blood, and you'll be safe. It's the same story today. Oh, that you would flee to Christ. Man, woman, boy or girl, flee away to Jesus, the Son of God's love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Let's bow together in prayer. Let us all pray. We do want every eye closed, every head bowed, perfect stillness and reverence in the Lord's presence as we come to the end of this meeting. You know, ultimately, there are only two kinds of people in the meeting. There are those who are saved and there are those who are not. There are the redeemed, there are those who are yet slaves of passion, lust, and pride. Only two. Where do you stand? Where are you before God? If you're not saved tonight, I trust you'll get grace to admit it. Oh God, I am a sinner. Can you honestly confess that? I'm not saved. If I were cut off where I sit, I'd be lost eternally. But I want to be saved. I long to be redeemed, to be among the redeemed of the Lord. I would love to know my sins forgiven. I'd love to have Christ. I want to tell you something. If you will have Christ, you can be assured He will have you. In Scripture, I find a willing Savior. It's sinners who are unwilling. Oh, that you would flee away to Jesus. Come. Repent. Believe the Gospel. Step out on the promise. And get under the blood. If I can help you to Christ, I am here as your servant for his sake. It be my privilege to open the book of God with you and point you to the Lord Jesus. Father in heaven, we thank thee for our kinsman redeemer, we thank Thee, our Father and our God, for Him who is bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh, who bore our sins in His own body on the tree, who died the just for the unjust that He might bring us to God, who is able to save to the uttermost them that come unto God by Him. We thank Thee that the Lord Jesus 
has been presented to men and women tonight. There are many in this meeting who need the Savior. God have mercy upon them. Save the lost. Complete family circles. Save husbands. Save wives. Save sons and daughters. Complete families in Christ tonight. Lord, we pray that thou wilt break the power and the grip of sin and Satan. O oh, thou great and powerful Redeemer, snap the fetters. Thank God Christ breaks the power of cancelled sin and sets the prisoner free. Lord, we pray that thou wilt set prisoners free tonight and that there will be rejoicing in heaven over redemption that has been accomplished by Christ being applied to the hearts and souls of men and women by the gracious operation of the Spirit of God. Hear our prayer. Part us with thy very richest blessing. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon all thy people, and let thy gracious Holy Spirit continue to speak thy word in every heart with saving and edifying power. We pray these things looking to thee to grant us the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit our Comforter, both now and evermore. We ask in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen.